All right, well, welcome to our uh, February meeting. Hard to uh, believe it's already February. It seems like we were just together and it was uh, right after January, uh, right after the holiday. And uh, you know, I don't know about you, but our February is so busy, I'm talking to people like it's already March. So I, I don't know what happened to February in my calendar, but uh, we're moving along. But uh, we're sure excited to come in. I was telling uh, uh, Doug, uh, as I was preparing this morning for our talk, I really didn't have any trouble getting motivated. I was like, well, of course. You're talking about God, you're talking about the way, and you're talking about football. <laughs> I mean, if you were to throw in my wife and my children into that, I mean, what more is there, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> there might be a few other things, I don't know. But anyways, we're excited. Uh, Mike and I are going to uh, try to tag team this. And I think we have a good message building off of uh, what we were talking about uh, last month. Um, so I guess just to get, we'll just jump in and get started. Um, you know, the title was uh, Follow the Way to Win Your Business Super Bowl. And Mike and Doug and I, as we uh, talked about KBA and going, we thought that this was a great message as to when we're in business, um, there ought to be a goal, I mean, a, a high goal. There, in fact, there ought to be multiple goals, right? But there ought to be the ultimate goal in your career and in your business. There ought to be a, uh, an excitement about the journey, about going from where we are to where we want to go as part of that goal, right? And, and there's a way to get there. And as Doug mentioned, when you think about the Super Bowl, you know, it has a lot of similar aspects to it. Um, fortunately for, uh, for me, as far as relating to the Super Bowl, and maybe for you too, is, you know, having lived in Denver for so long now, you know, I've been a big Bronco fan for a long time, and I've been to pretty much most of every big game the Broncos have played in the last 30 years. And certainly I've been through the heartbreak of the 80s, the highs of, you know, winning in Cleveland and the lows. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to go to the uh, Super Bowl in San Diego. And this is my ticket when uh, John Elway won his first Super Bowl. And I must tell you that that was uh, right up there as to one of my best days. It was a very exciting weekend and a very exciting game. Um, and so again, for me, as trying to tie this business pursuit into the Super Bowl is, uh, is, is fairly easy. But what I wanted to start with is, I think it'd be important that as we go through this, at some point, I think God wants us to, to think outside of our day-to-day lives, think outside of the struggles you might be facing right now, or, or even the successes, but he wants you to think about what does your Super Bowl look like? And that's really what this message is about, is um, each one of us, you know, God has created for success, and he's given you skills and talents to achieve something. And I think sometimes we set our sights too low, and so at the end of this talk, what I'm hoping is that the Holy Spirit will have spoken to you and re-encourage you as to what does your Super Bowl look like. And in fact, if you don't mind, we'll just pray for a second. And Father, we thank you for your word and your way, and we just pray that uh, each and every person here would hear your voice as to the direction, as to the way, and as to this Super Bowl-type achievement that you have in store for them. And we only seek your word now in Jesus' name. For, uh, for us in business, I thought this was also kind of an interesting um, time, is that we're really close to one of our Super Bowls. And I really hadn't realized that when we selected the target. And I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I only want to draw some analogy to it. Because I think that, again, it will help maybe stir up something inside of each of us or, or stir up something that we might be able to talk to somebody else about, whether it's a coworker or a boss or, or a child or somebody we know who might need encouragement. And for us, our Super Bowl is, uh, is occurring as, as one of the largest clients we've ever served. In fact, it's twice the size of any client that we've ever served before. And it's an extremely high visible project. And for us, as we go about providing environmental construction services in the field, 
Uh, one of our uh, reasons for being is that we like to glorify God and we like to bring righteousness and justice and cleansing to, to the land. And so this site happens to be part of a huge EPA forced cleanup action. So it involves a lot of US EPA government people. It involves the state of Florida. It involves a major company out of Canada. It involves right now, today, and for the rest of uh, the next, this week and next week, there's a huge lawsuit that's going between the buyer of a property and the seller of the property, and we're working for the buyer. And as we look at this opportunity, it's like, wow, this is exactly what we get excited about. We get to bring know-how and, and, uh, and, and integrity and service to a situation. We get to help establish a righteous outcome in this lawsuit. We get to highlight the way we do work to some of the largest uh, influential government institutions in this country, both on a federal and state level. We get to hire a bunch of people, and we get to go in there and do a good job. And we get to work in Florida in the winter, which is, <laughs> I mean, God, how, how, how does it get better than that? <laughs> but I say that because you have something, too. God's been working in you for a long time, uh, some people longer than others, but he has something in store for you. So uh, my clicker, oh, there he is. We'll go to the next page. We could do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> okay, so this talk, I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about the Super Bowl uh, and how it ties to business. We're going to talk about the way, and then we're going to talk about the beginning where we all need to start before we enter the way of why. So as far as the Super Bowl in business, I have some observations and lessons. I think you'll, you'll agree with these. I mean, ultimately, I mean, it's the ultimate experience for victory or loss from a cultural standpoint for many people in, the, uh, you know, in this country in particular, right? And I think, you know, with that in mind is there's an ultimate experience for you in your career and in your business. And that uh, there's a few times in life where winning and losing is so well defined. Many times in life, you know, well, you didn't get this deal or that didn't quite go right, but that's all right, I got another deal. But when we talk the ultimate experience, it's either the highest high or the lowest low, and there's no middle ground. There's no tie in the Super Bowl, right? And I think that's true in, in, in our experience, and I think it, it challenges us. Um, it's certainly one of the highest uh, achievements. But as we look at what goes into it, and as you, you know, watch from the outside and study it, one, it requires a very solid plan, and this is a multi-year plan. And just like in your job and your career, God's been working on you for many years. And it's that combination of years and experience and dedication that allow us to achieve that success. And it requires a solid foundation. I mean, look at the, the winners of the Super Bowls pretty much over the last 30 years. How many of them just stumbled into the Super Bowl and found their way? I would say Denver maybe in the 80s, but that didn't turn out so good, right? So I think it requires a solid foundation, and just like that for our plan, you know, for our business, it requires a solid foundation, a dedicated plan, and execution to it. And then, quite frankly, as Doug was talking about the Super Bowl, if you saw it, I mean, it requires a fortunate set of circumstances. Comes down to the last play, and Coach Carroll makes a call. And that decides the ultimate high and the ultimate low. I mean, you talk about a, 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 a circumstantial situation, and I think for us, too, is that winning that deal or advancing and buying that company or getting the right job, you know, there's some favor, there's some fortune, if you would, associated with that. And I think it's important to, to buy in, to understand that. And then usually it's all in. And I think part of our encouragement here today is that um, I – not all of us are going to want to uh, target our ultimate success or our Super Bowl. I mean, at the end of this, I really you know, encourage you to pray about, are you ready to target what that is, and are you ready to go all in? Because for most of our lives, we go 80% in, but we have a plan B. Well, if that doesn't work out, Kit goes and he tries to get a new client. Well, that client doesn't work out. Well, I always got the one I have now. 
or, you know, in your own circumstance, you can think about that. But I think to win the Super Bowl of, of, of the business, you have to be all in, just like this. There is no plan B. And oh, by the way, if you are successful in your Super Bowl, because when you watch the actual Super Bowl, you know, what was it, Russell Wilson, after he won last year, like immediately after the game, he said that he was thinking about how he's going to win next year. So there's always a repeat to it as well. But the repeat becomes possible because of the foundation and the plan and the heritage and, uh, and the other things that were there. So as far as the, uh, the, the business lessons, um, as I thought about it, clearly, you know, for anything substantial like that, and I can think about uh, there was a time when I was in my 30, early 30s, part of a, a large uh, $5 billion to $7 billion contract. I was 30 years old. I was a key member of the team, and we won. I mean, talk about fortune to be in the right place at the right time. But I thought about all the people all the experts that came in to make that possible. And then I think about, well, there are people that work within, uh, within you, uh, within your company, around you, but there are, for instance, free agents. If you look at the teams that win today, you know, they have a bunch of free agents. And you know, free agents are great because they bring in this super duper amount of talent and skill, but free agents are difficult to manage because they're really not committed as much as somebody who's been there a long time. But for us in the business world, we're dealing with free agents all the time. Some of our clients are free agents. Some of our suppliers and subcontractors and others are free agents. So part of the challenge is how do we get an alignment in place for those that are more intimate with us versus those that you know, just show up for a big paycheck with their expertise and then take off. I think that you know, clearly when you look at the assessment and the survey and the performance assessment that goes into running a football team is, I don't think there's anything comparable. I mean, they're critiquing every player, every game with video and, and I mean, there's no hiding, right? When a player, when an offensive lineman, you know, misses a block, it's for everybody to see. And I think that in our business and in our career, it shows us something too, is that if you want to be excellent, You've got to measure it. You've got to observe it. We can't be afraid to, to, to recognize in areas we need to improve. And I encourage us to be thinking about how we're doing that on an ongoing basis. Um, and then lastly, as I said before, is that when you look at teams that win the Super Bowl, especially the Patriots this year, they were built to win. They lost in the AFC Championship last year in Denver. Great game. But... Bill Belichick and the team went out and he plugged the holes that he had. They were built to win. They've been built to win for decades. You know, go through the, the, the great teams of the past. They were all built to win. They took the time and they made the effort. And I, and I ask us, are you built to win? Have you put in the time, put in the energy? Have you, you know, aligned yourself with the people you need to be aligned with and, and put your plan together to win? Not everyone will do that. And again, how many teams are there? There's 32 teams. I think if you were to probably look at all those teams, you know, there's probably only a handful of teams that really, truly put everything in and are built to win. And just like us, when we work you know, around people and work with businesses, very few are built to win. Very few make that effort. And the last one that I want to highlight is it takes time. You know, it's very rare to see anybody in any of the sports all of a sudden win the championship. It's a, it's a multi-year process of almost getting there, heartbreak, lose, go back, restructure, and do it. And the same thing, you know, with you and I is we've had our heartbreaks, we've had our disappointments, but those are a building block. And, and I just, you know, encourage you, if you're, if you're doing your time, keep, keep doing it. And, of course, as we've heard uh, throughout uh, the, the years now is that it's an integrated life. It's not just about the business, it's about the personal side as well. And I think everyone here realizes you can't separate your personal way and walk from the business side. Okay, next diagram. So I don't know if this shows up very well. It was an idea I had. Hopefully it makes sense to you is that um, 
So I know we have, how many folks came up from the tech center? How many people came from Westminster and North Glen or to the north? How many came from Golden? So what you see here, you see these different lines all converging on Faith Bible Chapel. So we all came from different places. And right now we're all together. Now, this assumes we all need to go catch a plane. Well, if you do Google Maps, you know, you can see there are multiple ways to get to DIA. And I think that's a reflection of, of, of God's plan when we talk about, you know, our own business or our career is that we have our past and we have our, our, our current situation and we're gathered together and you're gathered together with people you work around with and clients you work around with and, and other, uh, you know, relationships. But you have a destination. Unfortunately, many of you haven't written down what that destination is and I encourage you to think about that and do it. But then part of getting to that destination is there are multiple ways to get there. And this is just an il illustration to, to, to reconfirm that there are multiple ways that we can take to get to the destination. You know, Jesus spoke about in uh, John 15, I'm sure you all remember the you know, scripture about the vine and the branches and that you know, we are the branches and he's the vine and how we can do nothing without being in him. And what that was referring to is a, uh, is, is a relational intimacy, right? It's about not just taking the steps to get there, but it was about being in a relationship with Jesus to know the way to go. And I don't know if you, you realize this, but I've been uh, studying quite a bit of the early church history and did you all realize that uh, the early followers of Yeshua, I mean, it was known as the way. Did you guys know that? And I did a little research. This, I think you might find this interesting is when you look at the Old Testament and the, and the prophets, and it goes all the way back to like Enoch and Noah, and Noah you know, it, in Genesis says they walked with God. Um, there's a scripture that says, uh, but those who act justly love mercy walk humbly. I mean, you can go on and on. There's the way of the wicked, Proverbs 15, 9, and the way of the righteous. To walk in all his ways, Deuteronomy 11. Uh, there is a path of God's commands in the course of the just, but there is a counterfeit way which seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death, Proverbs 14. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, Jeremiah. You can just go through, you do a, you know, pull, do, do a Google search or do a search in your Bible on the way, and all of a sudden you start to realize a lot of the scripture is written about this, you know, the, the, this idea of the way. And of course, now with Jesus is that in the Sermon of the Mount, you know, he talks about the broad way that leads to destruction and the narrow one that leads to life. In John, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Did you know, I didn't know this, that uh, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, you guys are familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you've, you know, they found it in Qumran, in the community there, do you know what they called themselves? The Way. Isn't that cool? In fact, uh, the uh, Hebrew word for repentance, and I'm not good in Hebrew, but it's uh, Tishaba, suggests the idea of turning around and going back to the Way. So I think part of the message that we want to show is in order to get to the Super Bowl and to win the Super Bowl, the way is the key to success and achievement. And I think many of us short-circuit the amount of time or cut short the amount of time we put into the way. In fact, when you look up the definition in the Old Testament of way, it's D-E-R-E-K, and yeah, it's the way, the path, the route, and the road. But this is the cool part. It's the journey. It's the conduct of the way of life. And so in order to get to this highest achievement, we need to put more focus in those areas. So there's a, uh, as we talked before, there's a convergence of the team of people with a like mind and heart. I got to ask you, are you aligned? Are you partnered? Are you... Uh, uh, 
working with people of like mind and heart. It's the key to getting to, that group, to, to your success area. In Scripture, uh, acknowledge, uh, always acknowledge him. He gives you the straight paths. But this is an, a cool one, is that when Moses was, uh, was crying out to the Lord for forgiveness after the uh, Israelites went off the way and built the golden calf, I always find this fascinating. Moses' primary prayer is, God, show me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and that you would be glorified through your people. So even Moses, who had a close relationship with God, it started with, teach me your ways. Because when we know his ways, then we know him. And then it becomes easier to follow that way. Okay. So what are the business lessons for this? The first one that came to mind is that in the scriptures, and when we look at the patriarchs, and when you look at you know, keys of success, whether it be in business or, or, or in sports like the Super Bowl, you've got to have the foundation in place. And I can tell you also that um, there's a, uh, when you go on to a, a site, and on your property, how many of you own property? Own property? There's a, uh, there, there's a marker, a survey monument that marks your property. And when you go to any place, when we go to a site, the first thing you do in order to establish the site is you find that monument survey marker. And you build from there. Until you find that marker, you can't go anywhere. And it's the same in our career and our business. You have to have some kind of, of monument, some kind of fixed marker that you can always go back to that says, well, this is my foundation, this is where I start. Because if I get lost, how do I know, you know, how to get back on track? I have to go back. And that can be, you know, it's part of the relationship with God. It's part of your calling. What makes you unique? What makes your business unique? What makes your career and how you're going to serve unique? If you haven't identified what's that unique one thing, I really encourage you to think back about that. Here's another example that I think is, is huge that I've seen is that how many of you are asking God to help and guide you in your business or career? How many of you face obstacles? What I start to see is I pay attention more. Maybe you already figured this out. It takes me a while sometimes. The obstacles that, that show up aren't really the problem. What I find when I look behind the obstacle, it's God showing me what needs to be addressed in order to advance? And I've seen this so many ways. Uh, if there's an issue with a client and the client is complaining about something, you know, I've learned now to listen. And yeah, some of it might be just whatever, frustration or he had a bad day or whatever. But I tell you, more times than not, there's a nugget in there of something we need to do better. I encourage you, stop thinking about the things that come up. You know, you want to go serve this client, you want to finish this job, and this comes up or that comes up. Stop looking at that as the problem. It's not the problem. It's your solution. Because God can't build in your life on a broken foundation. He has to have a solid foundation. He wants you to have a solid foundation. He wants to grow it beyond what we can even imagine. And he wants us to, to achieve that highest success. But what happens is we don't want to take the time. We don't want to embrace the, uh, the struggle in trying to figure out how I'm going to fix that problem. So what happens is we pray for advancement, he gives us the opportunity to fix what's broken and to learn what needs to be learned, but we don't want to enter into that uh, to solve the problem. Guess what? Go back. In uh, Isaiah 1 and 2, um, it's a pretty fascinating um, scripture that, and again, this is to encourage us. It might be to encourage somebody you know, is that, Isaiah's writing where God, of course, is frustrated with the Israelites. Is that news? <laughs> kind of come to realize that now. But this is a cool uh, interpretation of it. You know, basically, in Isaiah 1, it says, They have forsaken the Lord and, and have uh, spurned, the, spurned the Holy One of Israel, turned their backs on him. 
We say, oh, I don't turn my back on God. Uh, be careful. I, you know, sometimes unintentionally, I, I find maybe I've turned my back on God. Um, it goes on to say, when you, uh, I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and, and lambs and goats uh, when you come to appear before me. He who asks this, uh, who has asked this of you, stop bringing meaningless offers. These are pretty significant warnings. Have we ignored God? Are we not listening? Are we not following his way? And then are we just trying to buy our way out of obedience? So the Lord says, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. And he goes on, so if our prayers aren't being answered, here's some indication of areas to look at. And he says, okay, how to get over it. Make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the case of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. And why do I bring that up? Is because I think that if we're going to follow the way, and, we, and Jesus you know, shows us the way, we've got to be honest with ourselves, both from a, from a personal standpoint and from a business standpoint. Are we ignoring God? What are we doing that's not righteous? You know, we talked a couple months ago is, I don't have any more favor in God than Larry does. I mean, just because I walk with God doesn't mean that I can be unrighteous, unjust, unfair in my business dealings with Larry. It doesn't work that way. We're to seek, you know, the righteousness and justice. I talked about, you know, this job we have in Florida. That's one of the main things we get to bring to this situation. And we, we're not that we're perfect, because we're not perfect, and we're still learning, but our heart is set on bringing righteousness and justice to that situation. There, it, Isaiah 2 goes on, and maybe you remember this, because I think it's, uh, it talks about the last days, but this is a, a great picture of the way uh, uh, that Jesus you know, is teaching us. And that is that at the end days, the people will come to the uh, Mount Zion and they will uh, seek the Lord, right? But it goes on to say is that he will teach us his way so that we may walk in his paths. He will judge between the nations, and this is the cool part. He will settle disputes among many people. Maybe your business is different than my business, but there are always disputes. <laughs> There's always either an employee thing that we're trying to work through and make right. There's always a supplier thing where somebody's not happy. There's always a, a client thing where there's a contract. And our, we, we do thousands of contracts every year. And somebody didn't fully understand one of the terms in the contract. It always comes up. Does that make the person that we're in a disagreement with wrong and unrighteous and unjust? No. That's just the way of life. Is it's a complex uh, exchange of services and support, right? Is, do you find that true in your, in, in your walk in the business world? There's always some kind of thing that has to be resolved. And what I see here is, is, is God recognizes that as part of our walk in business. And he says, let me settle those disputes. Bring them to me. I mean, we have a huge one going on right now with a potential subcontractor on this job. And we just find them to be totally unrighteous in their approach to the job. You know, there are those companies that, you know, sell you something at a low price, but then they add on all these extras in our business change orders. I think that's what, you know, maybe this company is, is off to do. And, you know, we're just drawing the line saying we're not going to go there. That's not the way we do business. And we don't want to be aligned with you. Um, you know, of course, we all know that, you know, if it's my way, then that's pride. If it's his way, then we can trust him. Um, one good test that I was thinking about that we could do, each of us, to figure out, you know, what is kind of the way in the Super Bowl, take yourself out of the equation and take your business or your job or what you're serving and ask what wouldn't be done in the kingdom of God. If Mike weren't supporting his clients, what wouldn't get achieved? And if you can't answer that question, then I don't think you understand what the primary purpose and calling of your life is. I mean, again, is it righteousness? Is it justice? Is it a high level of service? There's something 
that you are uniquely bringing forth and to be on, as it says, uh, Jesus' leadership team, which I think came from Mike, is you got to figure out what that is. Okay, next page. So we talked about there's some high-level achievement for you. There's a way to get there, and there's a way not to get there. And I think we want to be on the right way. But it all begins with why, which is kind of what we were just talking about. And it comes with alignment. So, you know, what is that Super Bowl for me, for your company? What's your motivation? I mean, deep down, you've got to bring this before God. Is it pride? Is it that I want to be able to show my family or whatever how great a success I am? Is it, is it, is it the deal? I'm going to talk later on about some of these warnings. I mean, I've seen plenty of, of situations, and I find myself sometimes, that competitive spirit is that, well, there's a deal out there, and, you know, we go to a, a site, uh, an opportunity bid meeting, and there's 10 other competitors. I want that deal. I'm going to do whatever I can to get that deal. Sometimes I think that might be a wrong motive. What am I bringing forth? You know, the right motive might be is that, well, we have the perfect set of skills and talents to provide a high quality service to that client so that he gets his needs met or she gets her needs met and God gets glorified because they'll recognize that we did it righteously, justly, without change orders and doing it right the first time. That's a right motive. That's the right motive to go try to serve that client and win that job. So what's your motive? Um, First John 1.5 um, well, it's important we read that one. Is that sometimes in, in our relationship with God, you know, you and I will be shown something by the Holy Spirit that we need to work on, right? And we bring it before God, and we repent, and, we, you know, we, we ask God to help us get over that. There are sometimes where we'll bring our deeds in and say, oh God, did you see what I did today to my wife or to my husband or to a coworker or something? Have you guys done that? I mean, maybe, I think you're like me. I mean, God is constantly showing me some things like this. But rarely will we take the time to bring the why we're doing it to God. As I just mentioned, the motivation. I think if we're to truly get on the way to this achievement success, we've got to begin with God saying, God, I want to serve that client. I want to grow this business. I want to do these things. And then say, God, I think I want to do it to glorify you. But there might be something in there that seeks my own pride, that seeks my own greed, that I want to take the proceeds from that and you know, do something that you don't want me to do. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to do any of this stuff. None of this has to get done. But if we're going to be on the way and you want to achieve the greatest success that God has in store for you, I think we have to do some of this, if not all of this. We have to bring our why before God. And then, as I said before, is I think we've got to memorialize this, this why as well. We've got to write it down. Maybe it's in your mission statement so that everyone around you sees that and you can share it with the people you're working with. But you've got to be able to, to go back to that because, you know, life is fast. Oh, my gosh, right? <laughs> it's so fast. Things are happening so quickly with issues and everything else. And I get off track sometimes. But it sure is nice to be able to pull that card out or go back and say, oh, yeah, okay, that's where I start. This is my area. And especially if you're in a, in a storm, if something really has hit you from the side you didn't expect and you just feel uncertain and, and not certain where, you know, your feet are on firm foundation, it's nice to be able to go back to that. That's why you got to memorialize it, I believe. Okay, the business lessons in this area, again, that deal blindness, you know, pursuit, win at all cost, um, a strength and a weakness, you know, your strength can become a weakness, that, that strong focus to get that job done or to win that client or whatever, I can get really, really, really focused. <laughs> it's a strength. But sometimes that really focused alienates people. And it doesn't honor God. And I got to work on that. But I don't know. What about you? 
the unjust gain. This is a, a one that the Lord showed us a, a few years back, and that is that I believe from a from a, a if we're following the way of Yeshua of, of the Word of God, that there is a gain to be gain, to be gained from doing a service and providing a product or whatever, but there's a warning too, and that is that if you take advantage of somebody or take advantage of a client in some way, or take advantage of a worker, there's an unjust gain rule that comes into play, and it's tied in with greed, and that is that, you know, there's honest weights and measures. It's a, as, as I provide something to Larry at, at X, and yet then Terry comes in, and tomorrow I sell it to him for 2X because he needs it more, I think that's a problem. I don't believe that that's God's heart. I know it's not. God showed us that about 10 years ago. Is uh, We had a client come in. They were desperate for a service, and we needed the work. But we thought, oh, wow, this guy is desperate. We'll give him our, uh, our premium price. And we started to do that, and we almost lost the deal. And we, re re we did need the work. <laughs> and I was praying, like, God, I really need this. And the Holy Spirit reminded me, is like, <clears throat> I brought you that client. Now you're going to take advantage of him? So it's very important when we go about serving, you've got to establish a fair price and a fair gain for the price that you're, uh, that you're offering. And you've got to bring that before God because there's a lot of complexity. I mean, you know, why do uh, some attorneys get $500 an hour? Well, you know, there's some reasons that certain prices are high and certain prices are low. But you have to go through that analysis to make sure that it's a fair price. And then, of course, unequally yoked is um, the more I've been in business, the longer I see is that if you're going to follow the way that in your intimate circle, you can't be unequally yoked. I'm sorry. I mean, I've done it. I've justified it, and it doesn't work. You can't get to where God wants you to go unequally yoked. You could disagree with me. That's fine, but you can't do it. Uh, <laughs> So, and then, of course, you've had success in your life. And I remember somebody was talking about Seattle's chance of repeating. And it was one of the old NFL coaches, like, uh, that had been there and done that and repeated. He said, here's the biggest problem to repeat, is that everybody in the organization now believes they need a raise from the the star football player to the secretary to the whoever else in the organization, because we're now world champs, I need a raise. And it was because of me. And therefore, all of a sudden, that alignment and that team effort that got you there is now dissolved. And I thought, what a great, uh, what a great warning. Okay. So lastly, this is a picture of, uh, obviously, a very powerful river and waterfall. And I spoke just last month on this, is that when, we're, when we have the right why, when we follow the right way, then success is not because of what we're doing, is you're in the middle. You're right here. Is there anything going to stop that? There's nothing going to stop it. Absolutely nothing can stop you. And that's the message. And I think that, you know, I hope that, you know, we could share this with others. I hope that we'll pray about it ourselves and think up through some of these reasons why. And I know this group and the people we're associated with can, be, can achieve that Super Bowl victory because it's within you, and you know the way, and when you spend time, you'll have the why. Okay, and then we have Mike going to follow up with a, uh, another uh, aspect of this. So, built to win. I love that point that Jim made because it really makes you think, are you ready to win? And there's a quote that I love, and maybe you guys have heard this before. Um, it said, you need to build capacity in advance of demand. Have you guys ever heard that one before? Build capacity in advance of demand, which means... That big contract Jim spoke of, if he had himself and a secretary and bid that job and got it, could they complete it? Nope. 
because the capacity wasn't there. Capacity personnel-wise, capacity experience-wise. So in our lives and business, how can we build capacity getting ready for God to bring the, the Super Bowl in our business? And I would submit to you that there needs to be capacity built in business. So you need to look at aspects of your business. How is your customer service? Because you know what? That can be a big old hole in your bucket if you're doing a lot of marketing and sales and all the right things and you get a client in and your customer service is poor. Now, all of a sudden, that negates all your hard work. So how can you build capacity in your business? How can you build capacity in your personal life? If you sleep two hours a night and you're running 100 miles an hour every single day, do you think that you are even in the mindset of doing your best work? No. So I just think that's a huge, huge um, point to think about. My first slide, and these are just a, a very few slides here, how to win your business Super Bowl. One thing, no plan B, implement. That's what I'm going to talk about. Remember this movie? W where did that come from? City Slickers. So Curly says one thing. So where should you focus 100% of your energy? Now, 100% of your energy doesn't mean everything else is ignored. That doesn't mean 100% of your energy for the rest of your career or the rest of the year. It just means when you look at things in your business and your personal, remember um, last time when I talked about uh, biblical goal setting, and if you missed it or want to watch it again, remember it's on the website. Um, the video is, the transcript, the downloads, the Jim's talk, and these slides will be on there today. Um, a couple of the handouts that I have uh, are on there as well. So remember to go to the website and under the media tab, you can see this. But what we talked about is there are different pillars in our life, business, spiritual, um, relationships, health, money. You know, and when you can work on these areas, can you give 100%, you know, oh, I give 110%. It's a nice little cliche saying, but it's impossible. You can't give 110% literally. And can you give 100% in all of these areas at the same time and be effective? No, so maybe part of your way and part of your plan, your overall 30,000 foot view should be, Lord, I feel you're, you're telling me I need to work on this area and this area and this area. Maybe my 100% focus, this one thing, is for the first quarter. Because don't you know that if you get something really dialed in well, it doesn't take that much work to maintain it, right? And then you come back to it two, three quarters later, and you can do another little tweak and see where you've come because you need to evaluate, and like Jim said, survey. So no plan B. Jim mentioned that. That's a, uh, a quote from John Elway, and you can look it up because I found it online. That's where I found that picture. Um, and how would you like to be Wade Phillips? Wow. I mean, what is, what is John Elway's goal for the Broncos? One thing. Give me that Super Bowl. And, or, or not Wade Phillips, well, Wade Phillips too, but um, uh, Kubiak. So having no plan B means you've got that one thing in mind. And you're, you're not, like Jim said, you're not just kind of wishy-washy, one step in or on the fence. You are all in. You're jumping in with both feet. And then our, one of our, um, you know, the other quotes that I like is Yoda's, try not, do or do not, there is no try. So if we could project ourselves into the locker room of the Super Bowl for either team, do you think the coaches said, hey, give it a, give it a good try today? I mean, for real. Do you think that they were just trying? And they, in, in the back of their mind, they're like, what am I going to do afterwards? Because we're in this cool town. And they were all in. And in our business, when we pick that one thing that we're going to focus on, okay, and, and we're going to try at that, I mean, in one sense, why bother? Because you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to just, you know, has anyone done, and my background is marketing, so has anyone done a direct mail campaign one time, you didn't get the results, and now you're off? Well, you can't do that. Or anything, a, a leadership training program in your business. Did you have one meeting and go, well, that didn't work? Well, what did you expect? You know, did you go to the gym one time and expect to look like whoever or drop 30 pounds? No. So when we have that mentality of, there's no plan B because I've chose that one thing. I'm not going to try. I'm going to do it. And you know what? If you get 100% and focus on that one thing and you get really, really, really close to that, and maybe you didn't get that Super Bowl, you know, ring, but you really got close. It's better than, than sitting on the sidelines with the remote control. So in our business, in our life, in whatever category that we're focusing on, we need to have that mindset of having no option but to win. 
Um, then my last point here is on the website right now are these two documents. And I think that part of what we need to be thinking about is, um, have you ever heard of the phrase knowledge is power? Well, that's a falsehood because knowledge is potential power. You gotta implement that knowledge. You know, you can have the way, you can have, if I handed, if I came in and had some inside knowledge of your business and I said, here's the blueprint for success, and you looked at it and said, yeah. I mean, and it was it just someone's opinion, you just knew this was it, and this was your plan, and if you carry this out all 2015, massive success, and you sat it down on the desk, and you went about your business, how much good is that gonna do? Zero, right? So you have to implement that knowledge. So these couple forms here, and, and I've got an exam, um, I printed off one of these just to show you. This is the um, clarity map there. It prints off in a nice uh, poster size. And I wanna just read a couple things from here, but the first one here is just having some vision statements and goals and I'm sure you have these kinds of things or you can Google and find others, but I just put a couple of examples on the website because number one, we gotta get what's in our head and our heart out on paper. And if you don't like paper, then on Evernote or whatever that we use that we're gonna refer to, right? But have something written down and there really is some power into having an idea. Haven't you ever gone like, oh, what was that thing? You gotta get that, you gotta get it down into something, whether it's a notebook you carry around that you can refer back to and at least you can go, where was that flip, flip, flip? Oh, there it is. So having something where you have a, you know, where, what's my, no, the vision for my whatever. This might be an area of your life, area of your business, but the vision is how can you get that down? And then um, I thought Jim's point about having those markers really plays well into this, uh, this kind of clarity map. The benefit of a marker is it's like a point in time. And it made me think of a lighthouse. You know, you, the, the concept of lighthouse is in a storm, you got a you got a, a, a marker to go towards. And if the storm is raging and you're fighting the waves, you still see that little light out there, right? And maybe in the airplane, in the um, air aviation world, there's those lights that show where the runways are. So it gives you those guidance. Well, in the example of the lighthouse, isn't it true that if there's a really big storm, you're distracted and you're fighting the waves, maybe you're not focused 100% on that, but you know it's there. So this right here is something that I, um, bought the license to and then I adapted and then you'll notice when you print it off um, at the upper left it, I, I added some good things for our um, kingdom focus spiritual uh, kind of a daily routine so Proverbs 29 18a where there's no vision the people perish well what this is is this is just an example model that you can adapt for your life for your business to kind of start the day off right um, and in the upper right, it says pre-launch, you know. Uh, so what are some goals? What are some whys behind your goals? Step one, um, calm your mind, close your eyes, pray, sit still. You know what? How many times do we jump out of bed or, you know, how, whatever it is. Maybe you're groggy and you kind of pull yourself out of bed, but you hit the ground running. And you grab that cup of coffee and you are out the door and you are sprinting all day long. And you come in and you have two seconds maybe there was a couple things that you should have done throughout the day and spend just a touch more time on. It might have been a little teeny bit more efficient, but we've got a thousand things to do. So this concept of just starting the day off with a calm mind prayer, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Help me not to miss what I need to do in my own life, in my own business, for your life, your life. Maybe you, maybe there's something. Have you ever heard someone say something and it just triggers a thought in your mind? If you were already thinking 10 steps down the road, you're not gonna pick up on that. And so maybe our, you know, there's a, there's a song, I think it's maybe Brandon Heath, you know, um, give me the eyes so that I can see, you know, the hurt around me. And to know, number one, that there is a need, and number two, that I can be, well, that takes a little bit more than just wow. So this first step, you know, calm, pray, um, and I'm not gonna go through all these, but just give, gives you just an idea. Number two, express thanks. You know, First Thessalonians, um, be thankful and in all things. So having a grateful attitude, read. Um, read your Bible study, read your, and don't just get caught up in only one type of Bible study or another, you know, read the scriptures. Make sure that that is a part of your day. Nothing wrong with the great authors of the day, but have that as supplementary. Um, uh, write. Does anyone in here have a prayer journal? 
that's common. One of my daughters at school um, just said, yeah, we were decorating our prayer journal, and oh, that's for, you know, having our prayer request that we can, oh, that's wonderful, love that. I've for years kept a gratitude journal. You know, a lot of the Old Testament is really the people, the children of Israel um, documenting where God has had his strong right arm and saved them, and, and, and now we can look back and go, wow, God came through. Well, can, can't we do that in our life? Can't we have right now, can you think of one thing in the past 60 days that God's really done? It's like, oh, that was really nice. Well, if you don't write that down and have a marker that you can look back on in six, eight, ten months, maybe it's in one and out the other. So if you have this short, this little short little entry, you know, today's date, hey, today I had and, I, and, and the Lord really came through for me. If you can build that notebook up and multiple, multiple entries, and you look back on it in your life, boy, you're going to be encouraged. I mean, even teeny little trivial things, and to me, those are the, some of the most exciting. The big things, the Super Bowl thing, yeah, those are obvious. But the little things like, Lord, I just would really love to be, and here's an example that sticks in my, in, into my mind. One time, uh, my wife and kids were going down to Costco, and, you know, they were doing the samples, and, you know, they were tasting this soup. Well, this one certain kind of soup, they were like, oh, this is so awesome. And they looked, and it was like, ooh, the price was a little. <clears throat> and so my wife was like, no, this, you know, it's a little expensive, so we can't get that. Well, she teaches at Beth Eden Baptist School, and they have one of the, one of the parents that come through, and they bring all the time, you know, extra food bank food. They just leave it in the teacher's workroom because teachers are so highly paid, right? So he, kind of like his little ministry, he leaves some things, you know, boxes of things, well, that exact brand of soup that the kids were pining for, that, that next day was um, uh, cans and cans of that sitting there, and, and it was a super, super encouragement. So to write that down and look back on it and go, thank you, God. So I would just say that this might be an interesting thing for you to adapt to your own life. Um, not that you're going to follow it step by step, every single jot and tittle, every single day, but it can be that marker, that lighthouse to kind of keep you, you know, in your personal life on the way to winning your business Super Bowl. And with that, oh, I'll leave you with one last thing. Can you guys all think of one person today that you could send an email to or call and say, you, you guys would, you'd really love coming to the KBA next month. Let me get you on the list to get the announcement. If, if we said... Think of 28 people. One. Can you think of one? So I'll be curly. Can, I, can you do one thing? Call one person, email one person, because wouldn't it be nice to next month have every single table full? And what do we get out of it? Nothing, but it's the brotherhood, it's the camaraderie, and the encouragement here. So I would leave you with that encouragement as well. Think of one person you can invite for next month's meeting. So, Mike, if you want to stand here, we could pray. Uh, as we uh, depart, you're welcome to stay and, and network. And again, yeah, please uh, consider bringing somebody. Uh, continue to look at our website. There's a lot going on with KBA. We're really starting to, to, to reach out, and there's, uh, we're going to do some outreach in a, in a meaningful way. So uh, please bring folks. And we certainly appreciate you coming and sharing with us. The other aspect is, you know, especially with this uh, plan that Michael's uh, put up here, as I've looked at it in detail, it's really powerful. It has a lot in it. And we'd like to hear from you, you know, as far as your testimonies, as if at any time any of these teachings or the KBA in general, you know, is a blessing to you, please share that. Send us an email, you know, a quick email just to let us know because, you know, we're certainly trying to, to uh, walk this with you, and it encourages us when we hear from you that, you know, something fit within your life.